Well, this talk is on levels of organisation. It's obvious the body is a highly organised, what do you want to call it, machine, mechanism, entity, phenomena. But the body itself, of course, functions within a wider social context. So when we're talking about healthcare, we need to think of the environment that an individual exists in. What is their physical environment? Does it contain pollutants? Does it contain dangers? Are they exposed to excessive heat or is someone exposed to excessive cold or flooding? The environment someone lives in is clearly going to impact their health and well-being. And then focusing down a little more, people, of course, live within social networks and our interactions with other people, with our family, with our children, with our parents, with our wives, with our husbands, with our employers, with our friends and our wider circle. All of these things have the potential to influence health as well. And numerous studies show that people that are living in a harmonious environment that have outside interests and social interactions experience better health than people that are isolated, for example, or people that are living alone. And basically people in any way who are not interacting with other people in a meaningful way. So we have the wider environment of the body. But then we come on to the body itself, an individual human body. Now, the individual body is composed of body systems. So we can talk about the muscular system, which is all the muscles in the body that facilitate movement. But of course, muscles can only work if they're innervated by motor nerves. And the motor nerves are a component of the nervous system, consisting of the central nervous system, which is the brain and the spinal cord and all the other peripheral nerves in the body giving rise to movement and sensation, and the brain in some strange way is generating the consciousness and the awareness that we have. Then there's another communication system called the endocrine system. And the endocrine system is all the hormone producing glands in the body. So you might have heard of the pituitary gland and the thyroid gland and the adrenal gland and the pancreas, the ovaries and the testes. These comprise the endocrine system. And all living tissues in the body need to be perfused with blood. So we have the cardiovascular system. That is the heart and the blood vessels. So we have the heart, the large arteries, the smaller arteries, the arterioles, the capillaries, the venules, small veins, larger veins, draining blood back to the heart, composing the cardiovascular system. Cardio, heart, vascular, the blood vessels. And then we have the digestive system. So you might think of the mouth and the esophagus and the stomach and the small intestine and the large intestine. And the so-called accessory organs of digestion, such as the liver and the pancreas, taking in large food molecules, breaking it down into more soluble, absorbable food molecules that can be taken away in the blood and lymphatic systems to nourish the body. Another system is the urinary system, producing urine. So blood is going to be filtered in the kidneys, purified blood return to the circulation, but waste products and products which are present in excess excreted in the urine. So we have the kidneys, the ureters, the urinary bladder, the urethra, and associated blood vessels comprising the urinary system. And another system is the lymphatic system. Now this absorbs excess amounts of tissue fluid and circulates them back through into the venous blood. So there's this circulatory component to the lymphatic system as well. But the lymphatic system contains lymphocytes and other white blood cells, such as macrophages and monocytes and neutrophils. And these are what protect the body against infection. So it's got this circulation of lymphatic fluid and this protection, this immunological function as well, the lymphatic system. And then the respiratory system, of course, is well known. So air is going to be taken in through the upper airways into the trachea, into the right and left main bronchus, into the right and left lung, 
into the smaller passages called the bronchioles, into the alveoli where gaseous exchange is going to occur, oxygen being taken in, carbon dioxide being given out. So the respiratory system vital for supplying the essential life-giving oxygen. And then finally, when we're talking about systems, we could mention the reproductive systems. So you might think of the ovaries where the ovum will mature. The ova are released from the ovaries into the uterine tubes. If they're fertilized, then they can develop into a new human being inside the uterus and they can be delivered through the vagina. So you might think about the testes producing the spermatozoa, the sperm cells, passing the reproductive gametes, the sperm cells through the vas deferens, mixing with various seminal fluids to produce the ejaculate, to produce the next generation. So we see the body is divided into these systems. And the systems themselves are made up of organs and larger structures. So we've already mentioned quite a few organs. So organs, if you like, can be the subunit of systems. So the systems are the subunit of the body, the organs and larger structure, the subunit of these important physiological and anatomical systems of the body. But then the organs themselves are made up of groups of tissues and the larger structures are made up of groups of tissues. Now a tissue is a group of similar cells with associated extracellular material. And that extracellular material is normally synthesized by these particular cells that comprise the tissue. So you might be aware of the four main classifications of tissues. Tissues can be connective tissues, nervous tissues, epithelium or lining tissues, or there can be muscle tissues. And when you come to learn about tissues, you can learn that connective tissue might include white fibrous tissue, loose tissue, elastic tissue, adipose, that's fatty tissue, lymphoid tissue, as we've talked about in the lymphatic system, cartilage and bone, and we also include blood as a connective tissue. The nervous tissue is composed of neurons. A neuron is a specialized nerve cell. So there might be neurons in the central nervous system, and you're going to learn about motor neurons, sensory neurons, and relay neurons. A motor neuron facilitating movement, a sensory neuron allowing us to experience sensation, and relay neurons often connecting those together. Now, muscle tissue is quite easy. There's really only three types. There's skeletal muscle attached to the bones of the skeleton, there's cardiac muscle in the heart, comprising the myocardium of the heart. And there's smooth muscle, which is in hollow organs such as the stomach or the bile ducts or the ureters or other hollow such structures, which often work in a fairly automatic way without us having to think about it too much. Now, an epithelium is a tissue which lines and an endothelium would be a tissue which lines an inside structure. Simple epithelium can be squamous with flat cells or ciliated with small hairs, cilia coming out of the surface of the cells, cuboidal, which are square-shaped cells, and columnar, which are column-shaped cells. But epithelium can also be stratified. It can be hardened with keratin, so-called keratinized, or it can be non-keratinized, as you might get in soft areas like inside the vagina or inside your cheek. And there's another form of stratified epithelium called transitional epithelium lining, such structures as the bladder and the ureters. So that's another level of organisation, the tissues. So we've gone from the whole environment to society, to the body, to body systems, to organs and larger structures, to groups of tissues, down to tissues. And we've mentioned that the tissues themselves are composed of groups of cells with associated extracellular material. And that leads us on nicely to the next level of organisation as we go downwards, and that is the level of individual cells. Now, individual cells are specialised to perform a particular function in a particular tissue. So as we've mentioned, you can have muscle cells 
or you can have blood cells. Cells which are differentiated to perform a particular function. But all cells share the same basic arrangement. There's a cell membrane around about the outside. Then there's a cytoplasm. And in the middle of the cell, at least at some point in its lifespan, there is a nucleus. Now in the cytoplasm, there's a fluid called the cytosol. And then there are the organelles. The organelles are the functional units of the cell. So ribosomes, for example, will synthesize protein. The Golgi complex will export things from the cell. The vital mitochondria will generate the energy that the cell requires to fuel its physiological processes. Within the nucleus, there is the genetic material. So in health, humans will contain 46 individual chromosomes. And these chromosomes are made up of histone, structural proteins, and also the DNA, the deoxyribonucleic acid, which is the genetic material coding for the production of proteins, all contained within the nucleus of the cell. So that's the next level of organisation, the cells themselves. And then, as we've said, the cells themselves contain these functional units called the organelles. Now, the organelles are made up of large biological molecules. Organic molecules are simply molecules which contain carbon. But biological molecules are often very large. So there's large protein molecules, large fat molecules. Very often, carbohydrates can be associated with proteins to form glycoproteins. Large, complex biological molecules, mostly coded for by the genetic instructions in the deoxyribonucleic acid in the nucleus of the particular cell. But then these large biological molecules are broken down into smaller, mostly organic molecules, working at the level of chemistry. So chemistry really is the study of the interaction of molecules. And chemicals can exist in solid form, in liquid form, or in gaseous form. And at some time you might have studied the periodic table that lists the 92 naturally occurring elements on the surface of the planet. Now there are more elements now because humans have made more heavy radioactive elements, but there's 92 naturally occurring elements, that's all. And only 26 of these elements are present in the body. And only four of these are so-called major elements. These are oxygen, carbon, hydrogen, and nitrogen. So you are mostly made up of carbon, hydrogen, oxygen, and nitrogen. And then there's another eight elements described as the lesser elements. So there's calcium, phosphorus, potassium, sulfur, sodium, chlorine, magnesium, and iron. They're the so-called lesser elements. And there's 14 trace elements in the body that are only present in very small amounts. So it's amazing that we're made up of these just 26 elements arranged into chemical molecules, arranged into larger biological molecules, arranged into organelles, arranged into cells, arranged into tissues, arranged into groups of tissues, arranged into larger structures, arranged into body systems, arranged into bodies that exist within their social context. And going down onto smaller and smaller scales, we can think about atoms. So you probably know that atoms have a nucleus with protons which have a positive charge and neutrons which have a um, no charge. But there's also electrons which are negative as well. And this is why we can have ions, charged atoms. Actually, when an atom ionizes, it becomes an ion. It's no longer called an atom. But thinking of them as charged atoms is quite useful. So because electrons are negative, if an atom gains an electron, that means it becomes a negative ion. So you might think of Cl, chloride, minus. But if we take away an electron, then the overall ion becomes positive. So you might think of sodium or potassium, which have one positive charge. But if we take away two electrons, then the ion develops two positive charges. So you might think of magnesium or calcium, which has two positive charges. So atoms that comprise the element can all be given an atomic number. That's the number of protons that the element contains. 
and they can all be given an atomic mass, which is the weight of the protons plus the neutrons. Now, the electrons do have a mass, but it's actually very, very small mass. So in basic chemistry, we don't need to consider it too much. But the unit of atomic mass is called a Dalton. And if you wanted to know, neutrons are 1.008 Daltons, just over one. Protons are 1.007 Daltons, just over one. Whereas electrons are 0.0005 Dalton. But these atoms are going to combine together to form compounds. And a compound is simply two or more atoms of two or more elements, bound together using ionic covalent or hydrogen bonding. So we can think of the body at the level of chemistry down to the level of the atoms itself. And the subunits of the atoms themselves, the electrons and the protons and the neutrons, these are all made up of smaller fundamental particles or more fundamental particles. And these are governed by the physics of quantum mechanics. And as time goes on, we're probably going to learn more and more how the physics of the very small, this quantum physics, affects larger physiological systems. So it may be that the brain is working using quantum mechanical principles. We really don't know actually how the brain is generating consciousness. So it's quite interesting to think about the body in these hierarchical units and in this amazing series of organizational steps that make up the organizational structure of the body. Each one needing to be in place to provide structure for the next one, to provide structure for the next one, to give us an overall organized body. So when we're talking about the body, the structure, the analysis of that, the study of that, that is anatomy. The functioning of the body is the physiology. When we're talking about tissues, the study of tissues is histology. And of course, these things can go wrong. So when anatomy goes wrong, we would have pathology. When physiology goes wrong, we would have pathophysiology, patho meaning disease of. When the tissues go wrong, we would have histopathology. Down to the levels of cells, the study of cells is cytology. And again, if they go wrong, we can have cytopathology. Down to the level of the large biological molecules, the sciences there are biochemistry. And of course, we have biochemical pathology. Things can go wrong at the level of biochemistry. Chemistry is studying the interaction of the molecules. And when we get down to the level of the atoms, we're into the fields of physics there. Although, of course, there is an overlap between physics and chemistry. But when we get down to the quantum world, then we're well into the domain of physics. So lots of different disciplines, thinking about normal structures, normal functions, lots of things that can go wrong, thinking about abnormal structure and abnormal function. And all of these underpinning the functioning of the whole human body, which is what we are interested in as people that would seek to care for patients, as people that would seek to maintain health in individuals and maintain health in communities. So if you're just starting off in this field, you can see you've got lots and lots of fascinating things to study. Don't try and do it all at once. This is a process. You don't learn these all at once. You learn these as you combine them with patient care. The two go together hand in hand. And hopefully the end result will be, indeed I'm sure the end result will be, that you will become a knowledgeable practitioner.